Hi friends, in continuum I shall be discussing hypernatremia in this video. So just to recapitulate, normal serum sodium values are between 135 to 145 mq per liter and hypernatremia is when serum sodium values are more than 145 milliequivalents per liter. There are principally two major mechanisms to understand. Either the gain in sodium by the body is more than the gain in water or the loss in sodium by the body is less than the loss in water. Ultimately in hypernatremia what happens is that there is a shift of water from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid because sodium is osmotically active. This leads to local hyperosmolality and cellular dehydration and this finally leaves, leads to symptoms and signs which are most prominent in the central nervous system. Now the body adapts physiologically to this process of increased osmolality in the extracellular fluid. This adaptation can be rapid that is occurring within few hours and it is due to, due to the intracellular accumulation of other electrolytes. Along with this, this correction can be slow which is due to accumulation of organic osmolytes or generation of ketogenic osmoles now recognized as amino acids, polyols and trimethylamines. So what happens is that the dissipation of these osmolytes out of the cells is very slow whenever you are correcting hypernatremia. So rapid correction of hypernatremia carries the risk of cerebral edema. This you must be remembering is in contrast with osmotic demyelination syndrome or central pontine myelinolysis which was seen with rapid correction of hyponatremia. So just to avoid the confusion I have mentioned it over here again that rapid correction of hyponatremia will lead to CPM or ODM whereas rapid correction of hypernatremia will lead to cerebral edema. The common causes of hypovolemic hyponatremia are gastrointestinal losses like diarrhea or vomiting, fever which causes evaporative loss, central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, head trauma, chronic kidney disease, diuretic therapy and increased insensible water losses like in premature infants those on warmer or phototherapy and in patients with burns. Causes of euvolemic hypernatremia are decreased access to free water for example in an unconscious patient or essential hypernatremia. Essential hypernatremia is basically a dysfunction of the osmoreceptors. Hypervolemic hypernatremia is seen iatrogenic cases are the most common when there is excess IV fluid administration for example bicarbonate correction for severe metabolic acidosis or sometimes inadvertent IV 3% hypertonic saline infusion, sodium chloride ingestion, seawater poisoning and excess of mineralocorticoids that is Cushing syndrome. The clinical features related to uh, central nervous system are irritability, lethargy, generalized weakness, seizures, coma and even sudden death. Along with this there will be symptoms of the underlying cause but one must remember that symptoms of volume depletion are very rare even in hypovolemic hypernatremia and this is due to the relative preservation of the intravascular volume and maintenance of skin turgor. So skin turgor is an important marker of dehydration so one must not rely on uh, looking at the skin turgor for assessing uh, dehydration in patients with hypernatremia. Rather mucosal dryness would be a better clinical marker to see in these patients. So symptoms of hypernatremia basically depend on two factors. First is the acuteness of rise in serum sodium and second is the severity of serum sodium. Complications which you might encounter in patients with hypernatremia are intracranial hemorrhage which can be subarachnoid, subdural, intraparenchymal or intraventricular but very rare. Central pontine myelinolysis and extrapontine myelinolysis and even thrombotic complications which are primarily secondary to intravascular dehydration. So once again I would like you to pay attention to the fact that central pontine myelinolysis and extra pontine myelinolysis are complications of hypernatremia per se and rapid correction of hyponatremia. So the investigations which you can go for in patients with hypernatremia are serum osmolality, electrolytes, renal function test, blood glucose and blood gas. And in urine you should go for osmolality, sodium, potassium and chloride. 
Along with this, you can calculate fractional excretion of sodium ion, which is urine sodium upon plasma sodium into plasma creatinine upon urine creatinine, and fractional excretion of water, which is plasma creatinine upon urine creatinine. Why do you need to all know all this? If you really want to study hypernatremia, is because of the fact I am showing in the next scene. So, if a patient is having hypernatremia, you should first assess the extracellular fluid volume. If it is decreased, then you must go for urine osmolality. If urine osmolality, there can be two possibilities. Urine osmolality can be increased, that is it can be a concentrated urine or it can be decreased, that is it can be a dilute urine. In either case, you go for the next investigation as urine sodium ion. Now, when the urine osmolality is increased and urine sodium is less than 20, you must think of causes like gastrointestinal losses. When urine osmolality is increased and the urine sodium ion is variable, you must think of inadequate intake or pyrexia. But when the urine is dilute and the urine sodium is variable, you must think of causes like diabetes insipidus and in cases of dilute urine with urine sodium ion more than 20, you must think of acute kidney injury and diuretic therapy. You must also remember that if ACF volume is normal to increase, then the values you might get on lab investigations are urine osmolality can be variable, urine sodium ion between 75 to 100, fractional excretion of sodium ion more than 1%, and fractional excretion of water can be normal or high. Now, whatever be the reason of hypernatremia, the correction of ABC, that is airway breathing circulation, takes precedence over that. So, if the patient is in shock, we do resuscitate using isotonic crystalloids irrespective of the values of serum sodium in the patient. And switch over to hypotonic fluids like N by 2 or N by 4 only once the intravascular volume has been restored. But what is important to remember is that the correction of hypernatremia once the intravascular volume has been restored should not be more than 0.5 MEQ per liter per hour or more than 10 milliequivalents per liter per day and that too over 48 to 72 hours because of the risk of cerebral edema already discussed. Rather Nelson's gives a, a duration of are duration in hours over which the serum sodium values need to be corrected in hypernatremic dehydration. So, if the sodium values are between 145 to 157, it should be corrected over 24 hours, between 158 to 170, over 48 hours, between 171 to 183 mq per liter, should be corrected over 72 hours, that is 3 days, and between 184 to 196 should be corrected over 84 hours. Now, if you want to understand the management as someone had asked me in detail, I would first like you to know a few important concepts. Important is that whenever a patient is presenting with dehydration, then there are three kinds of fluids which you need to give to the patient. First is the maintenance fluid which is required for the normal physiological homeostasis. It is required by every individual, either we take it uh, orally or the patient requires IV. Second is replacement of the deficit deficit is the losses which have deficit is the uh, lacuna which is created due to the losses which have already occurred in that patient and finally there is replacement of the ongoing losses now in hypernatremia what happens is that most of the time the ongoing losses aren't there except if there is vomiting or diarrhea and then you must understand that deficit comprises of two kinds of deficit First is the free water deficit. Free water is the water or the part of the solution which does not contain any inorganic electrolytes. So, in case of hypernatremia, whatever water is free of sodium is referred to as free water. So, free water deficit needs to be corrected and it is calculated by the formula 0.6 into body weight. This entity gives us the total body water into 1 minus 145 by the current serum sodium into 1000 and the second thing is a solute fluid deficit solute fluid is that part of the fluid which contains the solute dissolved in it that is the sol uh, fluid which has sodium in it then the degree of dehydration is calculated is, is uh, clinically assumed to be mild dehydration is 5% of the body weight 
Moderate dehydration is approximately 10% of the body weight and severe dehydration is approximately 15% of the body weight. These figures are 5, 7.5 and 10 for malnourished children as is the case in most some of the cases in India. Now to correct hyponatremia, there are three approaches which different people follow which are mentioned in different places in different books. First is the provision of maintenance fluid, the provision of deficit replacement and the provision of ongoing losses, replacement of the ongoing losses. The second is maintenance fluid given along with free water deficit. And third approach is giving the maintenance fluid at 1.25 to 1.5 times the value. For example, we will see the examples later on. Now coming on to the first approach. Now you want to give the maintenance fluid along with the replacement of the deficit. So what you will do is that you don't know what is the fluid which you should give. So for this purpose you will calculate the solute fluid deficit. And this solute fluid deficit is the deficit fluid which you have calculated and uh, as per the percentage dehydration and into body weight. And from this you subtract the free water deficit. The free water deficit you had already calculated in the previous scene. You must also know that sodium to be replaced in this deficit fluid is approximately 10 millivolts per 100 ml of solute fluid deficit. And sodium which needs to be supplemented in maintenance fluid we all know is approximately 3 MeQ per 100 ml of the maintenance fluid. Now let's see an example. Suppose you have a 10 kg child with serum sodium of 160 millivolts per liter. So the maintenance fluid will be 1000 ml. Deficit fluid assuming moderate dehydration that is 10% dehydration will again be 1000 ml. So total fluid needs which needs to be given to this child is 2000 ml. And the free water deficit as per the formula is 600 ml. So the solute fluid deficit will be the fluid deficit minus the free water deficit that is 400 ml. As we already know that free water deficit and solute water solute fluid deficit as per this approach needs to be calculated only for determining the type of fluid you want to give to the child. We know that uh, sodium in the maintenance fluid ought to be 3 MeQ per 100 ml and sodium in the deficit fluid ought, ought to be approximately 10 MeQ per 100 ml. So cal with uh, remembering this sodium in the maintenance fluid for this child should be around 30 MeQ. Assuming the maintenance fluid is around 1000 ml and sodium in the deficit fluid should be around 40 MeQ assuming the deficit fluid to again to be 1000 ml. So the total sodium which needs to be given to this child is 70 MeQ in 2000 ml that is 2 liters that is 35 MeQ per liter. So with this we assume we nearly reach to the conclusion that fluid with the composition nearest to n by 4 is required. Why n by 4? Because 154 by 4 will be 38.5 MeQ per liter, which is approximately close to 35 MeQ per liter, slightly on the higher side. And you, you need to be very vigilant and cautious in giving this fluid to the child. The next approach is giving maintenance fluid along with only free water deficit replacement. The same example, the maintenance fluid for the child is 1000 ml. The free water deficit we calculated was 600 ml but so the total fluid which needs to be given is around 1600 ml but we don't know which type of fluid to be given with this approach. So basically we start with n by 2 that is 0.45 dns or 0.45 ns in these patients and gradually reduce the sodium concentrations further because rapid reduction would again lead to the complication of cerebral edema. Now coming on to the third approach which is the most common approach and which was used by us in KGMC. This is the maintenance fluid which is to be given 1.25 to 1.5 times the rate and this approach has also been mentioned by the Nelsons. So with this approach we see that maintenance fluid is 1000 ml giving it at 1.25 to 1.5 percent it comes around to 1250 ml to 1500 ml. 1250 to 1500 ml and again the type of fluid is not very clear 
so we should start with n by 2 that is 0.45 dns or 0.45 ns so as you have seen with the, these three approaches the first approach was slightly dangerous because we were supplementing 2000 ml to the child and at the same time we were using n by 4 so i would recommend going with the third approach which is an easier way and you can any time titrate by close monitoring closely monitoring the serum sodium values you must also remember that if the rate of fall in sodium is very less than 0.5 MEQ per liter per hour, then change the fluid to N by 4 and N by 6 accordingly as I have already discussed. And if any time the child develops seizures secondary to cerebral edema, you can administer 3% hypotonic saline to raise the serum sodium rapidly. You must also remember that in patients with acute severe hyponatremia, you can correct the serum sodium values rather rapidly with 5% dextrose in water that is D5W and uh, the basic concept is that you have to give a sodium free fluid and this you have to do this you can do rapidly because there isn't sufficient time for the body especially the brain to develop the edogenic osmoles along with this treatment of the underlying cause is the most important thing for example, giving desmopressin in patients with central diabetes insipidus, dialysis in patients with acute severe hyponatremia with renal dysfunction, secondary hyperglycemia if develops in patients with hyponatremia need not be treated since it maintains the osmolality while the sodium levels are being lowered. And you must also remember that dextrose concentrations which you are giving it, and especially if the patient has developed secondary hyperglycemia, should be lowered gradually. For example, from 5% to 2.5% and so on, because again there will be a risk of cerebral edema. At the same time, you do not need to give insulin for patients developing secondary hyperglycemia in, uh, with hyponatremia. Also, secondary hypocalcemia can be seen, and this has to be treated with IV calcium as and when required. So, along with this, you must do strict input output monitoring. Twice daily weight is recommended, 6 to 8 hourly sodium monitoring and paired serum and urine osmolality and electrolytes need to be done to make adjustments to fluid therapy if the patient can specially afford it. Hyponatremia impairs the release of insulin and of parathormone so must monitor the patients for hyperglycemia and hypocalcemia. Hyperglycemia not to be treated with IV insulin and hypocalcemia can be treated with IV calcium. So thank you so much for watching and please do share the knowledge. Thanks a lot.